So this thing is supposed to be a 2001 Toyota MR2 Spider. I noticed that we have a really good view of the rear sway bar, so I'm gonna use this chance to show you how it works and explain to you what it's supposed to do. So we're gonna take a look at the rear left wheel assembly of the MR2. In this area, we're only concerned with three parts. Uh, the first part being the wheel, rotor, uh, hub, upright knuckle, whatever you wanna call it, tie rod, all that good stuff. Let's just assume it's all one single piece to make this example a little easier to understand. Second piece is here, the shock, spring, damper, whatever you wanna to refer to it as. And then the third piece is the sway bar assembly. So that's the linkage and the sway bar itself. So now let's take a look at how all these pieces interact with one another. Since we're assuming this is all one solid piece, including the wheel, let's imagine that it, we hit a bump. When you hit a bump, the wheel's gonna move up, causing all of this to move up. As a result, this spring is gonna be compressed. So that's moving up as well. The sway bar linkage is attached to the shock. So if the shock moves up, this is moving up as well, causing the sway bar, the end of the sway bar to move upwards. This puts a twisting motion on the rest of the sway bar. Because if we follow the sway bar, it goes along the whole rear of the car. So remember, we're moving like this, so it's twisting like this. If you follow it along, that twisting motion is gonna move this linkage up as well. So on the opposite side, this part of the sway bar is gonna wanna move up. Now that we know that each end of the sway bar just wants to travel along with the wheel on each side, let's take a look at how this affects different scenarios while you're driving. So the first scenario I wanna cover is when you're driving along and you hit a bump with both wheels. Let's say you're driving and you hit a speed bump perfectly straight on. Both wheels are gonna travel upwards the same amount at the same time. So the right side is gonna be twisting it upwards and the left side is gonna be twisting it upwards. The net result of this is zero. Both sides agree with one another and the sway bar will actually have no effect on this. The second scenario gets a little more interesting. It's when the wheels don't travel the same direction. The most common scenario you'll see this is when you're cornering. If you think about it, you're taking a left-hand turn, the car's gonna lean to the right a little bit because of the weight transfer. So when it's leaning to the right, the right side of the suspension is gonna compress, and the left side is actually gonna go into droop, so it's gonna extend. So now, if we have the right side compressing, it's gonna twist that uh, end link upwards. And if the left side is in droop, it's gonna do it downwards. What happens here is that the sway bar itself is put into torsion. Essentially, it's just twisting. This means that now, when this side is compressing, there's another force, try the sway bar is trying to untwist itself. So it's being pressed down, trying to get it to extend. Meanwhile, this side is being pressed upwards to get it to compress, trying to level out the two sides. So the effect that this has, the two sides being leveled out, is now when you're going through a corner, the body's gonna roll less. Hence the name anti-roll bar. So that's the first part of the effect that a sway bar has on the car's handling. It kinda causes the body to roll less. The second part is actually how much load or how hard the car is pressing down on the tire. Tires have something called tire load sensitivity. What this is, is that as the load changes, you know, how hard the car is pressing down on the tire, the amount of grip it produces changes. So now that we have a sway bar that's pressing down on, a, on one side, and trying to lift the other side, it's changing the load on the tires. So now, essentially, it's changing the amount of grip the tires are producing. So in this specific car, the motor is towards the rear. I know in most cars it's towards the front, but the same logic applies. The motor's in the rear, so we can assume there's more weight on the rear wheels. 
So now, if we imagine going through that left-hand corner again, where the car is leaning to the right and pressing down harder on those right tires, since there's more weight in the rear, this rear right corner is going to have a lot of weight pressing down on it. So now what the problem is, is you have a big difference in load, tire load between the front right and the rear right. So if you're going through a corner, those two tires are producing different amounts of grip. So let's say that the rear is producing less grip, you're going to slide, aka oversteer. The front is producing less grip, you're going to understeer, so you're going to turn your wheels, but they're not going to provide enough grip to actually turn the body of the car. So now what all the clever en design engineers and vehicle dynamics engineers over at Toyota did is they found out um, how much weight is on each wheel and they found a specific thickness, diameter wall thickness of this sway bar in order to find uh, the resistance to twisting. And what they did is now they use that resistance to twisting to push back down or pull up on a wheel to even out the load between the two tires, producing um, a similar amount of grip between the two, allowing the car to be more stable. So there's one more effect that the sway bar has on a suspension system that gets a bit complicated, so I'm just gonna gloss over it. It's, di it's difficult to explain without a pen and paper in hand, but what it does is it changes the ride frequency. So essentially, it's just changing how quick the suspension system responds to an input. If you turn the steering wheel, the front wheels are, are turning. That means they immediately, uh, let's, let's say they immediately feel the effect of turning. It takes a little while for the rear of the car to catch up to what's going on. So you need a quicker response, so a higher frequency in the rear, so the two can even out, just like the, uh, the load between them. You want the front and rear to even out in order to get a nice stable ride when you're taking a corner. So let's just recap real quick. We have our wheel assembly. We have where the sway bar is connected. The sway bar is connected to a point that travels up and down. This end moves up and down and it's connected to the other side that moves up and down as well. The sway bar is put into torsion AKA it's just being twisted and this provides a certain amount of resistance to the wheel travel. Since they're connected, they affect one another, kind of evening out how much the wheels travel on both sides. This affects how much load is put on the tire. So this affects how much grip the tire is producing. This can be used to even out the grip between the front and rear of the car. So you're not sliding all over the place or that you are actually able to turn. It also affects that ride frequency. Um, that just affects how quickly the car responds to whatever you're putting it through, turning, bumps, whatever. So that about wraps up what a sway bar does in a suspension system. I'm taking this car apart. I noticed they had a unique view on the whole uh, assembly of a sway bar. So I decided to make this video showing people what it does for those that haven't gotten to work on a car themselves, haven't maybe seen another video that kind of shows how the whole thing works. So I'm hoping you learned something. Um, if you want me to make more videos like this, let me know. I am filming this whole build that I'm doing, but that's gonna come out at a later time. So if you're interested in that, let me know. Thanks for watching. I really hope you learned something. Take care.